G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. This is the third time I'm going to make, or try to make, part five of Australia's National Day of Shame. In the last week I've uploaded successfully a 28 minute movie, a couple of 27 minute movies. First time I tried this it was 29 minutes 20 seconds. I thought it was a bit iffy. I tried it. It ate 100 kilobytes and then it said movie rejected too long. So I tried a short talk version of it where I didn't interject at all. It took 24 minutes 20 seconds, got rejected for being too long. I'll see if I can keep this inside the 15 minutes by cutting it down to six pages instead of ten. And uh, yeah. So we take up the bombing of the Manunda, the hospital ship. Four people died as a result of the near miss and the direct hit claimed another eight. Among them Melbourne dentist Boynes Hocking. In all, 10 officers and men of the ship's crew lost their lives, 7 people were seriously injured and 51 had minor injuries. Yet in spite of the damage caused by the bombs, the Manunda continued to function as a hospital ship. The lifts between the decks were no longer functioning, but patients could be carried up and down the narrow companionways. At the after end of the ship, surgeons worked continuously to treat the injured and the dying. The white-hulled ship, conspicuous with its large red crosses on the funnel and deck, became a floating casualty clearing station as the wounded were brought to her side, many of them suffering from terrible burns from the burning oil. Matron Claire Schumack, the first matron ever appointed to an Australian hospital ship, was shaken by the blast of the near miss, but went on supervising the nursing. Often hardly able to see through the thick black cloying smoke from the fires of the burning ships all around them. Seven fires broke out on the Manunda itself and one burned dangerously for an hour before it could be extinguished. After the war, Matron Schumach was awarded the Royal Red Cross for her dedication. Also, after the war, Commander Fuchida blamed the attack on the Manunda on the pilot, insisting that he had disobeyed orders by attacking the hospital ship. Attempts to find any record of the pilot being punished or even reproved for his action, however, have never been successful. In Fuchida's favour is the certainty that if the Japanese had wanted to, they could have finished off the Manunda early in the battle and with the greatest of ease. She was the second largest ship in the harbour, after the Meigs, and she never made any attempt to move. Frederick Utting, the second officer on the Manunda, was one of many who believed that she was certain to be hit because she was surrounded by legitimate targets, but that the Japanese had not deliberately tried to sink her, but then... He did not see what Charles Stewart saw from his boat and from a range of only 150 metres. There were many acts of great bravery on the harbour that morning. It took courage to sail knowingly into a sea of burning oil. One of the most remarkable displays came from a 25-year-old coxswain, John Waldy, who worked for the Department of Civil Aviation and operated a launch between the shore and the flying boats. Single-handed, Waldy saved more than a hundred lives going backwards and forwards into the hell of the harbour to bring back survivors, until he was so exhausted that he hardly knew whether he was coming or going. Wherever people looked, he seemed to be always there, miraculously slipping between the bombs and steering his boat right under the burning ships or the bombed-out wharf. In an official report, he was described as being, quote, the leading spirit in rescue operations, and for his bravery he was awarded the MBE, Member of the British Empire. Even in the midst of the bombing, not everyone wanted to be rescued. At the height of the raid, rescuers came across the improbable sight of a man sitting alone on a raft, drifting on the tide across the harbour, sipping, sipping contentedly from a large bottle and protected from the sun by a large beach umbrella. He refused to be taken in tow. At one stage... The Japanese aircraft were not the only hazard on the harbour. The Australian ships from the Platypus and the Swan to the Zebra Stripe boom defence vessel Koala were all blazing away wildly with their guns. When they were aiming at the high altitude bombers they were reasonably safe, but against the dive bombers and the fighters, many of them coming in almost at zero height, they constantly threatened to shoot each other. One brave man whose tr true role in Darwin that day was known to very few people in the town was Master Mariner Captain John Williams. Williams was a director of the United Stevedoring Company and his highly secret assignment was to try to locate and bring to the surface a Japanese submarine that had been sunk about 80 kilometres off the coast from Darwin. He had brought a team of divers with him and they were operating from two of the ships which were in the harbour, the Tolga and the Yampi Lass. 
Williams was in town when the bombs began to fall and he threw himself into the gutter, which was the best protection that he could see. He stayed there right through the raid and by the time the all clear sounded he was buried in soil and dirt. He shook himself down and went down to find a hotel for a drink before going down to the jetty to see what help he could give. One of his work boats had come in from the harbour and he started the motor and guided it into the burning oil to pull out some Chinese seamen who were screaming frantically. Wherever he looked there were blazing patches of oil bearing down on him, carried by the wind and the tide. He had completed three rescue missions and was going back for a fourth when the motor suddenly stopped. As he worked feverishly to start it again, he saw that he was drifting into a patch of flaming oil. He looked round for oars, but they had either been lost or forgotten. Then, with only moments to spare, the engine suddenly sparked into life. Williams's divers on board the Yampy Lass had managed to manoeuvre the ship under a huge pall of black smoke from another burning ship, and they stayed there, undetected, throughout the raid. One of the most vulnerable ships in the whole harbour was the Australian corvette, HMAS Katoomba, which had to sit out the whole raid stuck in the floating dry dock. She was being repaired after a collision with an American tanker. In spite of her predicament, her crew who were aboard her put up a valiant fight with their single 12-pounder high-angle gun and the two Vickers machine guns mounted on each wing of the bridge. Every member of the crew was issued with a .303 inch rifle and they opened fire at the first dive bomber came in for attack. The pilot must have been astonished, for when he was only 300 metres from the Katoomba, normal release height, he suddenly veered off and his bomb fell harmlessly into the water, i.e. he missed. Minutes later, a second aircraft dived at them, and again her captain, AP Cousin, who already held the DSO, ordered the crew of the 12-pounder to fire with a short fuse. The gun swung round, aimed, and as the aircraft came in for the kill, fired. Again, the pilot was caught off guard. Yeah, didn't expect flak in a dive bombing raid. And as the shell exploded close to his plane, he climbed almost vertically. Yep, as they do, get out of the gunfire. The Katoomba was not troubled again. Lucky, got missed twice. With some understatement, Cousin later described being caught in an air raid when trapped in a dry dock as, quote, a most unenviable experience. But he and his crew had the satisfaction of knowing they had saved both their ship and the floating dock. Well, actually, the Japanese that missed was the decisive factor. The flak was good, but it was the bad bombing that was decisive. The tanker British motorist, with its cargo of oil and petrol, received two direct hits. The first on her bridge killed the master and a wireless operator. The second was further forward. At once, the order was given to abandon ship, but when the men jumped over the side, they found themselves racing a wall of blazing fuel oil that threatened to engulf them. Some never made it to the shore. Burning fiercely and listing heavily to port, the British motorist finally capsized and sank. There was one last moment of drama as the crew of the minesweeper Tolga was picking up as many survivors as they could from the British motorist. Just before she went to the bottom, it was realised that one member of the crew, a Lascar, had been left behind in his bunk. He was suffering from pneumonia and had been forgotten when every man was looking after himself. Two Australian seamen from the Tolga volunteered to board the ship and they brought the man out safely with only minutes to spare. The US freighter, Admiral Halstead, like the British motorist, was loaded with fuel, most of it high-octane petrol in 44-gallon drums. Damaged by a near miss and with her rigging shot away, her master ordered the drums to be thrown over the side and many floated harmlessly ashore. The Admiral Halstead was not seriously damaged. Without question, the most dangerous ship in the harbour that morning was the 6,000-tonne Neptuna, an Australian-owned passenger ship which had evacuated civilians from New Guinea and had then been sent to Darwin with supplies, most of which was high explosives. She should never have been there in the first place and would not have been had she been properly unloaded. As it was, she had been in Darwin since before the departure of the Timor convoy the previous Sunday and she had still not been unloaded. Service officers, most volubly Captain Edward Thomas, blamed the waterfront workers, but the union replied, and with ample justification, that Neptuna had simply suffered the fate of all ships trying to unload at Darwin. She had been pulled to and from the jetty every time another ship, particularly a naval ship, needed to refuel, 
because the only refuelling facility was a pipeline along the wharf. Whatever the reason, Neptuna had been in Darwin, noted, loaded with explosives and depth charges for the best part of a week, and on the very day when the senior naval officer fully expected an attack by the Japanese, she was tied up beside the wharf. Even worse, HMAS Swan was tied up between her and the open sea, so that she would be hemmed in completely if Swan was sunk or disabled. To cap it all, the engineers had chosen that morning to take down one of the Neptuna's engines so that she could not have moved even if she wanted to. As it happened, Swan cast off and got away when the raid started, suffering damage from a near miss that killed three of her crew and wounded 22. Although Swan survived, Neptuna was less fortunate. Cadet John Rothery was chipping paint below decks when the first bombs hit the ship with a violent explosion. He had heard no alarm or aircraft and he hurried up on deck to see what had happened. He stared in disbelief at a sky now filled with aircraft marked with the red rising sun of Japan. In the saloon he found many of the 125 crew gathered together for protection and they shouted to him to get down on the floor, but either premonition or claustrophobia drove him outside again after only a few minutes and this split-second decision saved his life. As he came out on deck, he saw a dive bomber appear from behind a cloud and scream across the water toward Neptuna. He watched mesmerised as its bomb came away and crashed through the bridge and into the saloon he had just left. Every man in there, more than 30 of them, was killed. The second, a second dive bomber followed up the attack, its bomb exploding in the engine room and setting fire to the whole ship. Rothery rashly ran down to the engine room to try to find water to fight the fires that were burning on the deck. He found it flooded out, but there were no hoses. There were now 45 members of Neptuna's crew dead and many more injured, some seriously. Survivors, among them Rothery and 62 Chinese seamen, jumped or were pushed by their friends into the water and swam as best as they could towards the shore. Many were temporarily blinded by the oil that still poured into the harbour from the fuel pipe that had broken when the wharf was destroyed by one of the first bombs. All round the harbour men knew what was going to happen. Every ship's master was aware that the Neptuna was loaded to the gunnels with high explosive and each now tried to put as much distance as he could between the stricken ship and his own vessel. Number three gang of waterside workers was already at work on the Neptuna when the raid began. As the alarm never sounded, they had no opportunity to get off and they took cover as best they could below decks. One member of the gang, Wharfie George Ty, suddenly became aware of a strange and very frightening sensation. Quote, she was beginning to rumble, he explained later, but you could feel it rather than hear it. The ship was unmistakably getting hotter like a huge cauldron that was about to boil. The wharfies went over the side and swam for their lives. Almost simultaneously on their own ships, Lieutenant Owen Griffiths on Platypus and Captain Cousin on Katoomba heard a low rumbling and saw that Neptuna had turned a glowing shade of red. Both men yelled a warning to get down and threw themselves onto the deck, and in the next instant, with a terrible explosion that rocked the town, Neptuna blew up. Lumps of red-hot metal showered down on the other ships and on the town, and entire masts were tossed like matchsticks for hundreds of metres. On the wharf, a shunting locomotive was tossed over the side into the water like a toy, and twelve trucks were totally destroyed. Engine driver Mick Dempsey and his fireman Barry Andrews were hurled into the sea and both received serious injuries. Said one witness of the explosion, it was like a volcano erupting, unquote. Moored on the other side of the wharf had been another Australian ship, the freighter Barossa, which ironically had a cargo of timber for the construction of a new wharf. Perhaps the Japanese knew what she contained because she came in for close attention from the dive bombers and they scored several direct hits don't think they were just aiming at whatever ship happened to be tied up at the wharf. But an even greater danger for Barossa was Neptuna. <coughs> Hindering any chance of escape was an abandoned lighter moored on Barossa's seaward side, and seeing her predicament, the naval tug Watto hurried alongside and after pulling the lighter clear, got a line aboard Barossa. If she could be pulled just a cable length clear, she might survive the explosion, but they were too late. Watto had hardly taken up the strain on the line when Neptuna exploded. Fires broke out on Barossa's deck, but miraculously she and the tug stayed afloat, as though the blast had gone straight over the top of them. And now 
I end this movie. More to come. Ciao.